morning and welcome to Shattering Myths, a program devoted to what we hope is, certainly needs to be, the fastest growing segment of our society. To those of you who know, as I do, that there is something dreadfully wrong, even destructive, about our religious institutions, political institutions, media reporting, and military invasions, even economic schemes. We've come to realize that these institutions are the problem, and as such, they will never be part of the solution. So instead of merely presenting an, <laughs> the news, excuse me, our mission here is to understand what is causing the tragedies that are besieging our planet, all while predicting how these events will influence our world if we don't stop them. And that is why, in our second hour, we're going to engage God on his terms through evidence and reason, since his guidance uh, regarding his covenant provides hope. And that's the lone place that we can turn to find it in this exceedingly troubled world. Our phone number, if you'd like to participate in this discussion of a lifetime, where we attempt to wield words wisely because they provide the answer for everything that ails us from economic room ruin to terrorism from religious myths to political hypocrisy is 877-300-7645. We're going to invert the order of our program today because as uh, it is Friday, uh, we're expecting IQ Al Rasuli uh, to call in and with IQ being the foremost expert on uh, Islam in the world today, it is uh, helpful to have him um, add his insights to what is happening in Egypt, in Syria. Uh, we have a news story we're going to have him comment on uh, in the United States. I'd like to uh, have him also comment on um, some of the doings in the Hassan trial as well. All will be a very common theme this morning, Americans' inability to understand why these things are happening. Seem. Uh, you know, 12 years after 9-11, still bewildered as to why Muslims kill. And so we'll discuss that in the, uh, the second hour of the program, because it is essential to you preserving your own life and the life of those you love, at least in the temporal realm. Now, speaking both of the temporal realm and also of uh, that which is eternal, uh, transitioning from both the physical uh, to the energetic, um, Yahweh said uh, the following, and this is where we were at the end of our program yesterday regarding the conditions at the Garden of Eden. Now, I'm going to uh, reprise our an introduction here because it is important to recognize this. Our planet is in a hellish mess. People are dying in the hundreds of thousands. And Soon, because of proxy wars like we're seeing in Syria and the spread of American weapons at places they ought not to be, and of leaders who are so grotesquely immoral and wholly incompetent that only wars will galvanize their political appeal, that we're going to see deaths on a scale unimagined before. We're going to see total and complete economic collapse, anarchy, even in America, especially in America, as we continue to play this game of deficit financing, pretending that our promissory notes that we call the dollar actually have value. It is going to be a very difficult ride over the next 15 to 20 years, no matter where you live in the world. And so in the midst of this, it's important to know that there is hope. And that hope comes through a promise that Yahweh introduced to us um, collectively as humanity 20 years shy of uh, 6,000 years ago as a uh, in written form so that all of us might know his plan, his promise, his offer. It was written for us about 1400, excuse me, uh, uh, 3400 years ago, 1400 BCE or 3400 years ago in his Torah. This is one of the oldest promises ever made. 
in terms of uh, a promise actually written uh, and kept. And in this, uh, Yahweh is saying, if you want to engage in a relationship with me, if you want to be saved by me, if that, if those things are of interest to you, then what I'm encouraging you to do is to use your nasalma, your conscience, your ability to exercise good judgment, and to examine, to observe, to closely consider all of the information that is available about the Garden of Eden, is what he tells us. But beyond just the Garden of Eden and focusing on it so that you, you come to understand it, and we'll speak to that in a moment, I want you to also focus on Abraham and Sarah. Now, it's interesting, he didn't say he had to focus on the covenant. He said, I want you to focus on Abraham as your father and Sarah who bore you. Now, Abraham's name means merciful, enriching father. And Sarah's name means to engage and to endure. And collectively, they give birth not only to the covenant, but to Yisrael. Yisrael means individuals who engage and endure with Yah, with God. And so God is saying, if you want to have a relationship with me, if you want to be saved by me, if those things are of interest to you, look to the story, my relationship with Abraham and Sarah. Come to know it and come to know the conditions that I conceived in the garden with Adam and with Yahweh. And if you do those things, then you'll understand. It's not complicated, but that is the perspective you're going to need to know me and to be saved by me, to engage in a relationship with me. So we have been examining what Yahweh had to say about his the garden of great joy, what existed there, dissecting the words that he used to communicate with us for the express purpose of following his advice. Now, one last thing before we jump back in. The Torah that this is all presented in is not only the only place where God introduces himself to us, so the only place you can come to know him as he actually is. It's not only the only place that the story of Abraham and Sarah and the covenant are told, so it's the only place you can know what the terms and conditions are for participating in the covenant, as well as the only place that tells you what their benefits are. The only place where you find a path to God that enables us to find hope, eternal life and perfection and salvation and, and adoption into his family, the ability to camp out with him, the seven-step path that he has provided. It's only delineated in his Torah. Now, while that is all true, so the Torah is the only document that you can find any of these things that are essential to forming a relationship with God and to being saved by Him. It's impossible to know Him, engage in a relationship with Him, or to be saved by Him apart from His Torah. That's a statement of fact. It's not my opinion. It's God's statement of fact. Now, beyond that, it is important for you to know that Torah does not mean law. That is a religious corruption. The word Torah in Hebrew means teaching, guidance, direction, instructions, the kind of thing that a father would provide for his children. And the most successful observer of the Torah in human history, the person that Yahweh called out to say, that dude, he's righteous. I'm going to base the millennial Shabbat, my thousand-year reign here on planet Earth, the culmination of of a thousand-year celebration for everyone that is part of my covenant, replicating the conditions that existed in the Garden of Eden, that I'm going to base it on that guy. His name was Dod, and name means love. We know him as David. Now, he was a very flawed guy. I mean, when it came to, uh, to, to doing stuff he ought not to, you know, David was, uh, was one flawed individual. But what David did is that he understood what it meant to observe the Torah. To observe is to closely examine and carefully consider. He knew how to use his nasalma, and he began, came to understand the Torah. Shamar, observe, bien, understand. And then he responded. He acted upon and engaged in a Shah in Hebrew. 
celebrated it, was passionate about what it was offering. And so he recognized that, and you look at the 119th Psalm, which is 176 verses, uh, eight verses for each of the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, in the order of the uh, those letters in the alphabet, capitalizing on what each of those letters convey to us, because it's those letters that comprise the words, which comprise the sentences, which comprise the paragraphs, which comprise the Torah. He doesn't mention a single rule. There isn't one rule in all 160, 76 verses. Not one. What David came to recognize, Dode being his actual name, love, came to recognize, is there's, there's three aspects of the Torah, and if you come to understand what they are and respond to them, you're golden. They are the prescriptions for living that cut us into the relationship, they're the terms and conditions of the covenant, and they're the means that Yahweh uses to exercise good judgment and to act justly with regard to our vindication. Chuka, Mishvat, Mitzvah. Those are the three concepts. And he goes over and over and says, that's what you need to focus on. If you focus on those three things and you come to know what they are, and that the Torah is the, is the place you go to present them, then you'll do what Dode says that he's going to do. He says, you know, I'm grabbing hold of the scroll of the Torah, and I'm coming directly to heaven, and you can't keep me out. It's not about being good. It's not about doing good. It's not about being obedient. There's not even a Hebrew word for obedient. It's not about following the law. It's about being observant, thinking, understanding, and responding to what our Heavenly Father is offering us. And that is beautifully presented in the story of the Garden of Eden, which is what God says he's going to bring back about during the Millennial Shabbat, a, a time that's going to begin on the 7th of October in 2033 and last for a thousand years. And because he's telling us that that's the conditions that we're going to return to, and because he told us that was the ideal conditions that his relationship with us began, we know that that is also the conditions that will describe our eternity. So we're going to examine his every word as it relates to the story of the Garden of Eden and the covenant that he established there. in the beginning, first and foremost. Uh, this is uh, from what we now call the second chapter, the, uh, the ninth verse. It reads, Yahweh Almighty, enable life to sprout up and grow from the ground, which is Adama, uh, the basis of uh, the man or Adam's name. All kinds of trees which were <laughs> desirable in appearance and good to eat. And then, in the midst of the garden, the tree of lives was put in the midst of the protective enclosure. Now, what's interesting here, uh, of course, is that Chayim uh, was written lives, as opposed to what you read in your English Bible, the tree of life. I guess the English Bible's uh, uh, figure that uh, God doesn't know how to uh, to say his own name. Doesn't even know what his own name is. So we're, they're going to re replace uh, Yahweh with the Lord. Uh, evidently, God wasn't smart enough to know that he should have done that. You know, much better for him to come off with this this uh, offensive, uh, oppressive uh, title and a title that that completely destroys the purpose of the garden and of free will because uh, lords control and they own. So I, I guess that God really wasn't capable of, of knowing that that's what he should have done, so copy editors of your Bible translations decided, oh, of course, the Bible, of course, is inerrant, even though it changed Yahweh 7,000 times to the Lord, and that, uh, that God was being foolish. He just a grammatical mistake, a typo probably, when he uh, wrote Tree of Lives, a Chayim, as opposed to the tree of life. So they decided, but we'll change that for him. Well, the first time that uh, we find 
uh, Che, life, in um, the uh, Hebrew text, is in Barashith 124. <clears throat> and here it reads, The earth will bring forth living souls after their kind, uh, moving organisms uh, uh, and established life forms. The life forms is uh, Chaya. Uh, and so this is our first uh, um Explanation is we have the earth will bring forth living chai souls and the life forms chaya. So chaya being a variation of chai. So it's used twice in the same um, a statement. Uh, and uh, then we, we turn to the next use, which is and Yahweh Almighty formed and for association and accompaniment Adam or the man from the dust of the ground, from the Adama, and he blew into his nostrils, the life-giving, restoring, and sustaining chayam. These are, again, plural. Mult multiplicity of life. Uh, and he blew into him the uh, life-sustaining conscience, neshama. And Adam came to exist, haya, as a living chai soul, nefesh. So here we have a contrast between Nesama, which is his conscience, and his consciousness, which is his nefesh soul. All animals, according to this testimony, have a nefesh soul. Only man, only humankind, homo sapien, was given a nefesh. Then we also have in the same text, Haya, juxtaposed to Chai, and Chai being living or life, and uh, Haya being existence, with the reality that uh, both of these words form the basis of Yahweh's name. Haya in, uh, in particular, God says when he introduces himself to Moshe and wants to go rescue his children from the crucible of Egypt, from human, religious, and political oppression, that his name is based upon the verb Haya. So, <clears throat> with that in, uh, in mind, we next uh, see a, uh, a presentation. Actually, this is the first presentation of the word for life, and it is uh, applicable to plants. It says, uh, Dasha, grow sprouting vegetation uh, and reproduce after uh, their kind by way of, uh, of seeds. And so he's talking about uh, I should say that actually this doesn't mention the word life, but it's God differentiating uh, animal life from plant life. Plants, from his perspective, dasha, they grow. They sprout vegetation. Uh, they, uh, they reproduce after seeds. Uh, he explains it's the animals and man that uh, chai are living in, the, uh, in this unique sense. So... With all of uh, that, we, we are really compelled to try to understand this word, chai, and uh, why it was deployed here in the plural. So to appreciate the reasons and to consider the root of the noun, chai, is uh, chaya, which in turn is based upon haya, which is the basis of Yahweh's name. What we come to realize is that chai, life, enables us to come to exist with Yahweh as Chai is based upon the life, the Hebrew word for exist, which is the basis of Yahweh's name. It's a chain that leads us directly to God. And therefore it applies or implies the idea of our Father nurturing us and being affectionate to us. <laughs> that most people are unaware of that is important relative to the, uh, the Hebrew word uh, for nourishing life, uh, the verbal form of life, Chaya. And that is that it is the basis of Chaya's name. Yes, there is a person in the story of the Garden of Eden named uh, Chawa. Uh, her name is based upon Chaya, the uh, verb. Most people don't know that because their English Bible, of course, their inerrant word of God, chose to change the name to Eve. Now, there is absolutely no, none, zero correlation between Eve and Chawa. They don't share a single letter in common. There isn't even a B in scriptural Hebrew. 
And there wasn't one E in her name, much less two. You know, so you have to ask yourself, why is it that every English Bible and every preacher and every book written about this and every comment made about the garden talks about Adam and Eve when it has been known for absolute certain for thousands of years that Adam's wife was Chawa. So what what is it about religious clerics that think that that it's appropriate for them to change the word of God? And that when confronted with the truth and they and say, you know, that's not right. Not owning up to their mistake. Kind of reminds me of all these uh, guys in uh, in baseball. Scott and I talk sports sometimes during the uh, the commercials. It's kind of the the uh, relief valve for you know all that ails the world uh, for uh, for us um, uh, boys here. And you know you have uh, the bad boys of, uh, of baseball, uh, in particular, that take performance in half enhancing drugs and and uh, and justify themselves as being you know perfect little um, angels. And then finally, they uh, they might come out with some lame excuse at the end. But religious clerics, here they are saying that their religion is based upon the inspired word of God. And then they go off and change it. And when they're confronted with those changes, eh, they'll continue to pr promote the lie. Now, I had a... A long meeting, it was about six hours long, with a guy that I had spent thousands of hours with, uh, many of them one-on-one, -on -one, a fellow named Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell, at the, uh, at the time that uh, I knew him, was the uh, most famous uh, religious uh, cleric in America. He was the head of the moral majority, the guy that, uh, uh, that uh, really began uh, the, this idea of televangelism, um, Jerry Falwell was a household name. Now I'm a little older than most of you probably. And and, uh, and so uh, if you're a younger listener, you, you may not know the name Jerry Falwell. But uh, Jerry Falwell's on the front cover of Time magazine. Uh, he was uh, at one time considered uh, on a time poll the single most respected man in America. Uh, I began my uh, research into a book I was writing called Tea with Terrace. Uh, which required me to uh, compare what the Torah's claims uh, were to the Quran, because the Quran says that it confirms the uh, Torah, and the book Tea with Terrorists was about my meeting with Al-Qaeda, and they quoted the Quran, so I uh, came to study the Quran. The con Quran constantly says that it affirms the Torah. So I, uh, I was required, if I was going to be fair and rational, to compare the Quran to the Torah to see whether or not uh, the Quran's claims could be validated because it says it's based on the, uh, the, the same God and that it confirms the Torah. And when I began to do this, the first thing that I noticed was that my translations are really bad. And as I began to study the, uh, the Torah in Hebrew, I thought, wow. <laughs> Most of what it has to say is not just opposed to what the Torah, or what the Quran has to say. It's opposed to what my own religion has to say. I was a Christian at the time, and so I continued to study. and And after I had spent about uh, three years in that process, I uh, wrote a um, yeah, about a fifteen to twenty page white paper, as they were called at the time, on the differences between Yahweh's testimony. Just the fact that it was Yahweh, not the Lord, and uh, the uh, um, the mythology of my religion, Christianity, and I took this white paper to Jerry and I said, "This is what I, I'm told him in advance. This is what I want to do. I'd like you to bring your foremost uh, Hebrew scholar and the, uh, the whoever you think is the the most learned man associated with Liberty University, which was the it's still a very large university down in Lynchburg, Virginia, where uh, Jerry Falwell hails it." And we spent six hours going through this white paper. Yahweh's name not being the Lord, with the Lord was Satan's title. That there was no Jesus Christ, that Christ wasn't a last name, wasn't even based upon Christos, but instead Christus, which is an entirely different word. And that it's a title, not a last name, and that there is no basis for Jesus anywhere to be found in the Greek text. It is Yahusha. And that the path to salvation begins with the doorway labeled 
Pesach, Passover, it's the same path that Yosha himself followed and enabled. It goes through each of the seven Moed Mikra, and that there's nothing uh, that replaced the observance of the Shabbat, changed it to Sunday. There's no basis of a Christian cross. It was a pagan symbol. There's no basis for a trinity. Yahweh says, I am one. And we went on and on and on. There's no basis of a church anywhere to be found. Christian was used as a derogatory term, and it wasn't even based on Christos. It was Christusian, even at the time. At the end of uh, the six hours and uh, going over scores of, uh, of contradictions between Yahweh's testimony, God's testimony, and the, uh, the Christian religion. For example, Christmas and Easter, which he celebrated in an over-the-top form at uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church. <clears throat> Once we finished all that, and I completely destroyed everything that he had said from his pulpit and that was uh, conveyed um, to his uh, television audience, as well as his radio audience, as well as to those who came to his church and came to his university. Uh, including that there's only one covenant and it has not yet been renewed. Uh, he said to me, as did the, uh, the, the senior professors, everything you've said is true. We cannot disagree with a single point you've made. It's all accurate. But if we were to say those things, no one would be sitting in the pews of our church. And if we were to say those things, the envelopes that arrive with checks in them to support our university would no longer come. And if you were to say those things publicly, they will label you a kook. That was pretty much the end of my relationship with Jerry Falwell. We continued to exchange pleasantries, but that was it. I went back and I wrote a book called Yada Ya. It's available now at yadaya.com. Subsequently written a book called Questioning Paul. It's available at questioningpaul.com, but I wouldn't go read it right now because I'm in the middle of a massive edit of it. Based upon what I've learned, I'm one of those who realizes that, you know, I make my share of mistakes. And uh, when you make a mistake, the thing to do is to go correct the record. I've learned a lot since I wrote Questioning Paul, so I'm in the process of rewriting it based upon what I've learned. And I've written a book called Intro to God. You can find it free at introtogod.org. And Jerry went on to continue to promote what he knew to be untrue. This is why it's very troubling to me that every theologian knows, every Christian pastor knows, that there is no Eve. That that's the name of a pagan sun goddess. It's the, no, I shouldn't say a sun goddess, it's a derivative of the sun god worship phenomenon because the, uh, the sun is said to impregnate Mother Earth and uh, Eve is Mother Earth on the uh, Sunday closest to the vernal equinox, which Christians now call uh, Easter, so that nine months later, on the winter solstice, the son of the sun is born, the Christian Christmas. And so Eve is the mother of God and the queen of heaven in the pagan mythologies. And so they've changed to that. They'll all hold up their Bible and they'll talk about their holy Bible and the Bible being the word of God and God doesn't use that term. It's based on uh, Biblia, the, uh, the uh, pagan goddess of the Egyptians. God did not choose a pagan goddess's name for his word. He never ever refers to his word as the Biblia. No. For him, it is the Torah, which is his teaching, and the prophets. Sometimes he'll refer to them as the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms, the Psalms being the writings. But Torah and prophets is sufficient because his Torah is in his prophets. Torah means teaching. And the Psalms are prophetic. But never does he refer to anything else. And there is no basis whatsoever for considering the Christian New Testament to be the Word of God or Scripture. The only thing that would have any validity whatsoever would be Yosha's words, but unfortunately we have two problems with them. 
he spoke in Hebrew, and the oldest text is Greek, so we have a translation of what he said, not what he said. And second, Christians were so desirous, I can't even say that they were careless in their transcribing the oldest manuscripts from one to another, because it wasn't carelessness. They deliberately changed the testimony to synchronize the various versions to eliminate what they thought to be conflicts, mostly conflicts with their new religion. And they were absolutely willing, as are clerics today, following their example, to change things to suit their own interest. And so when we look at the oldest 69 manuscripts, the 69 codexes that precede Constantine and the, the massive change that followed when uh, Christianity became Roman Catholicism, we find that there's 300,000 known variants between the oldest manuscripts, the oldest witnesses, and today's basis for English translations. And then on top of that, we find that English translations are very inaccurate as it relates to conveying what's written in Greek. You know, I'm, so I'm rewriting, questioning Paul, and going back to the Greek text that underlines those translations. Uh, I make it a point to say, you know, here's what the words are. Here's the order the words are presented. This is what the words mean. And now I want you to compare that to the three most popular English translations, because if you do it over and over again, you just realize that our English translations are more like novels, where religious clerics decided that their writing style was better than anyone else's, so why not have the freedom to say whatever they think needs to be said? The only thing you can trust, ladies and gentlemen, is Yahweh's Torah teaching. Rely on it, as we are doing now. to uh, Chawa and uh, Chaya. Uh, Chaya means to uh, nurture and provide life. Chawa is, the, uh, uh, is a metaphor for uh, the mother uh, of the covenant, Sarah. She's a uh, metaphor for the life-giving nature of the set-apart spirit. And when religious clerics, knowingly, purposefully, deliberately, change the meaning of that name, Chaya, life giver, the one who nurtures uh, life, uh, causes life to flourish, to rise, to be healed. Uh, to Eve, the name of a, uh, of a mother earth goddess, and they never bother to correct the record. Then you know that there's something dreadfully disingenuous about them. And the reason we spend so much time on this is that once you recognize they've lied to you in this, they've lied to you on the term Bible, they've lied to you about the Trinity, they have lied to you about the cross, they have lied to you about Jesus, they have lied to you about Christ, they have lied to you about the Lord, they have lied to you about the Torah, they have lied to you about the covenant being renewed, they have lied to you over and over and over again. They've lied to you about Christmas, about Sunday, about Easter. They've lied to you about the path to God that begins with Passover, which is the doorway to life. If you're listening to this show and you're still clinging to your religion, when are you going to let go so that you can grab hold of God? Because while you're clinging to your religion, you are not welcome in God's company. How many times do you have to be lied to Eve, Bible, Trinity, Cross, Sunday, Christmas, Easter, Grace, Faith, before you say, enough, you aren't trustworthy, and begin to study Yahweh's Torah teaching and find that he is. That's why we told this story. Returning to the referendum on choice and the tree of lives, it provides us with the potential to know God, to choose Him, to love Him. We were given the Chayam Nisama, the life-restoring, the life-sustaining conscience, the seat of good judgment, so that each Nefesh soul might choose to Haya, have eternal existence with Yahweh. So to that, 
to make a reasoned decision, to properly exercise free will, to be judgmental. We not only required an asama conscience, which Yahweh explained was based upon the verb shama, which is to not only to nurture and grow, but also to become exponentially greater than we otherwise would be. But we need options. There must be choices regarding these lives. Do we want our life to be mortal? Or did we want it to be immortal? Do we want it to be with man or do we want it to be with God? Do we want it to be in a relationship or do we want it to be religious? Options. Lives. One which leads to renewed life as one that ends in the termination of life, which is death. The tree of lives yields this choice. As we now know, it is the tree of lives, plural. God had a plan for restoring that which had not yet fallen. He knew that Adam uh, would marry, that he would rebel, that he and his wife would have children, so he conceived a plan to restore many lives, which is one of the reasons that Chayim is plural. In the opening stanza of the covenant uh, testimony in the Torah, we have been given a glimpse into Yahweh's fulfillment of these things. And speaking of the familial covenant, Chai is occasionally translated family, relatives, and kin. It is also rendered solemn promise, revival, and blessing of abundant life. As such, the tree of lives serves as a metaphor. It represents our Heavenly Father's promise to adopt those he and to respond appropriately, at least to adopt those who respond appropriately to his family. And many important words in Hebrew are in the plural. For example, we think of the Day of Atonement because that's how uh, uh, Yom Kippur is uh, often rendered. Well, it's actually Yom Kippurim. It's the Day of Reconciliations, uh, plural. It's even Bukurim from a Bakar, which is firstborn child, but now it's firstborn children. There's so many insights that we can glean from Yahweh when we understand why and when he chooses to convey things in the plural, including his title, Elohim.